o'clock. It is Tuesday night. Do you know where your DJ's at? I know where I'm at and I'm here with you. Yes, it's time for the DJ Roundtable. Uh, we seem to be missing a DJ tonight, but that is okay. Uh, everyone has stuff to do or has allergies or whatever. Um, hopefully that uh, you're enjoying yourself this evening and uh, join us here on a lovely uh, DJ Roundtable. As always, we have some great DJs here who give their two cents on how they would take an idea or how they would react to something or how they would do something. And we do this every single week um, here on Tuesdays on Twitch. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure that you follow on YouTube, like, follow, subscribe. Make sure you smash that like button. Uh, make sure you hit the bell icon so you know when we go live on YouTube. Uh, YouTube. And if we go live on Twitch, make sure you follow us on Twitch and you can follow the live and talk in the chat. Jim, I see you out there. How are you doing, sir? Hopefully you're recovering from your injury. Um, and then I see Jeff is in the chat as well. Uh, starting off tonight, uh, I wanted to go over guys with you guys with something that happened this weekend to me. And I know we do a lot of weddings. Uh, I'm a wedding only DJ, so um, I don't deal with like some of the things that some of you guys do with you know schools or clubs or stuff like that. I strictly do weddings, and to me, when doing weddings, it's always an an emotional thing because it's two people who found each other who are committing. To go down that go the aisle down the aisle to go down life together to be partners in life. And you know, most of us here um have a significant other or they're single, whatever it is, but they've had girlfriends or they have friends or they have family. And the one thing is that when you have that certain person you marry and stuff like that, it's always interesting from ceremony to ceremony how things are. This past ceremony really um, got to me emotionally. And it is the story of the bride and the groom. And they're sharing or their vows with each other. And a couple highlights, I don't want to go too much because it's kind of, you know, gets very personal with the vows. But I could tell you it was not a dry eye in the house. And even though I don't, we get to know them a little bit, the couples working with them throughout the whole entire months and weeks uh, doing everything. This was a quick turnaround. We signed the contract October 15th, and the wedding was just passed on the November 11th. So it wasn't even 30 days when you could get a chance to really get to know them. We talked to them, a great couple. Um, and one of the things was to, uh, listening to her story about how when they met earlier years, being together, was a very powerful part that uh, they were very much didn't have a lot of money. And they could afford one cheeseburger a day. I don't know, you know, double cheeseburger, whatever, McDonald's, Burger King, whatever. I don't know. But they can, that's what they could afford. They could afford a, a cheeseburger or a hamburger a day. That was their meal for the whole entire day. Um and the groom saw a homeless guy going through trash bins looking for food. The groom got out of their vehicle. Again, they were getting ready to go to work. Got out of their vehicle, walked over there, and gave him his cheeseburger. Said, here you go. You need this more than I do. And again, this is their only meal for the day. And this is a while ago when they first, you know, they were, they were first together and stuff like that. And you know, obviously it's, they've gone on since then. And, but when you hear a powerful statement like that, a powerful story like that from a couple, and they also talked about a bunch of other things too, that it was just very emotional. And even though, again, we get to know people, we get to talk to people, ask people questions and get, kind of get to know their story a little bit. This was kind of like, you know, most Vows are usually about love and loving each other, and they, you know, had some, you know, some hardships. But hearing this story from the two of them just got me thinking that, wow, this is, they had a hard time in the beginning. And 
the question for the table is, I, I think I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life, this, this, this couple, because the fact that it was just so powerful of a story, their vows back and forth, how they overcome everything and how they talk to each other and how they explained you know, how, why, what, how they fell in love with each other and how even it was very dark and difficult time in their lives together, they pulled through it and now they're on the, the better side of things. Uh, not only financially, but also everything. And they have a couple beautiful kids together. They've been together for a long time. They finally just said, hey, let's get married. Great couple. But is there a wedding that you've done that has a story or has a uh, vows or whatever it is that has you kind of like, I can remember this. I'll remember this wedding for the rest of my life. Because it touched me so much emotionally. Tracy was crying. I think everyone there was shedding a tear when they were talking to these, changing these vows with each other. And when they were exchanging those vows, it was just, I was like, what? Oh my God. Oh my God. It's like, not in a bad way. It's like you're watching, it, it's kind of like, you know, you feel like you're watching a movie, but this is real life. This is not actors and actresses. This is two people who love each other. And shared a very, very, very uh, difficult time in both their lives together and how they got through it and how they got deeper in love because of that and how they don't they don't forget how the other one helped each other out. And again, that story of him walking out and giving his only meal of the day to this homeless person saying, here you go, homeless person, here, have my meal. You need more than I do. To me, just a very powerful, powerful statement of that of him, and and also about both of them too, because the thing is that he, not only protecting his now his wife, but also down and out, he's still helping someone else out and is a giving person. Again, awesome couple. So I'm gonna start with Jeff. Do you have a couple? Do you have a story from a ceremony that you heard or a couple you met that have a really incredible backstory that you're like? Oh my God! This is, sounds more like a movie than it's real life, and it's just amazing. No, not really. <laughs> no, you don't have that. No, not not like you. Sorry, it's a good story. Yeah, I, I don't have much. Sorry. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go to Hunter. Hunter, have you done a wedding that have a really? Awesome backstory, or actually come from diver, you know, from bad times to good times in a backstory. Well, not really, but I do know that most times, like when I would DJ winning a year after, you know, a two sets, two, yeah, two sets of couples that got married back in 2021 and they're now divorced. So, two sets of couples are now divorced. So, not really. Okay, well, we, we want something positive, not <laughs> something negative, but... Well, well, it's common down here in South Carolina, divorces, where things don't go right when they get married. There's the, the, divorce divorce happens, yes, it does, but I'm looking for more so, of the positive side that, that you remember yeah, well, for the rest of your life. Well, no, because every wedding is pretty much the same, no matter what. Okay. Mr. Dixon, do you have a story that you want to share at the class that, you know, a couple you won't forget? Um, no, mine has been straightforward. And anytime me and my wife would go to a wedding, uh, our things will always be to at the end be like, ours is still better, and we fist pump. That's the, part, <laughs> the highlight of our, our ceremonies. Okay, yeah. but it was special for me, yes, it was special for me when I would DJ mostly family weddings, like my cousin Cheyenne and my brother. Those were the most special because they're because they're family, I've known them all my life. Oh, yeah. DJ Bradley, do you have a good story to share? You know, it would, I can't think of any backstories I've really caught that have stuck out so much. I mean, there was one I did a couple years ago where the bride and the groom were originally from the Chicagoland area, and it was at Celebrations on the River. And celebrations being the exact midway point between all of their families from South Dakota, Chicago and the suburbs and whatnot. So it was a destination spot. And the two of them 
found each other when they had just gotten clean and sober. And if you know anything about recovery, getting clean and sober, the one thing they advise you never to do is get into a relationship with somebody because it takes away from your centralized focus of working on yourself to better yourself. And in that same regards, bettering yourself to be with someone else. So you can be that person that they want of you and vice versa. So this couple kind of stayed in touch, but didn't really date. And when they kind of got into a point in their lives, which is like four years after they met, they were still in contact and they were like, okay, now's the time. Let's see if waiting was worth it. And it was like, that was six years prior to their wedding. So they've been, you know, talking for four together for basically, you know, 10 years. And they had a very, very interesting, you know, backstory behind it. But you could actually see that the time they took to focus on themselves and getting clean, getting sober and getting their head straight was really able to help them moving forward when they started really dating and being the right person for their significant other. And there was a wedding a few years before that that changed my whole perspective on just, you know, when you understand that, the feeling and emotion that goes into it. I used to think that, you know, my first few years of really doing weddings in lacrosse, because, you know, I might have done a wedding here and there, but I was a club DJ. You know, my whole mentality is you show up at the wedding you get through the formalities and don't mess them up and make sure you have a great dance party. That's your job. The MC part of it, no one wants to hear you. No one wants to see you. You're not in a club. Stay in your booth, hide out. Don't talk much, blah, 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 blah. And that's how I kind of approached it all until this one wedding, and it was 2017, that there was the father-daughter dance. And if I look back at my... I keep, you know, like a list of all the couples I've been the DJ for, where, what year and day. And I'm sure if I look back at the chart, I can tell you exactly what it was. But the father was a shaved head, big biker goatee, and you knew he rode. And he, even he didn't even have, he had his boots on under with his tucks. But he's this 300 pound, just manly man, you know. The, the guy you'd be scared of to meet in a bar. And he is on the dance floor with the father-daughter dance, crying his eyes out. And that was like the moment I'm like, wait, there's more to all of this than just the formalities. And it really kind of put me back in a position that you've got a lot to learn about this, son, if you're going to keep doing it. And that kind of made me watch other DJs, watch gig logs, take notes, and really focus how I handle weddings nowadays to better what I'm, you know, folk making it better. And it really changed how everything went for me. And with that and hand in hand, my skills, you know, obviously pursuing an education about it all, my performance and whatnot got better hand in hand with where I'm at today, which has been, it was a great learning experience to get humbled like that being like, this is what this means to this, Man, you'd be scared of to see down a dark alley or in a biker bar. He'd beat your, is what you would think. But when you see something like that, it's just like, wow, okay, I moved here. And then I thought about it. And in every booth except my light-up booths, there's a picture of my daughter. And, uh, you know, so now when I'm doing a wedding, I think about that moment. If, what would I want my daughter to have when she gets married? Would I want some chucklehead that thinks it's just a job? Or would I want that DJ to really dig in and apply at, you know, and work the wedding how it's supposed to be done? And that one wedding was the turning point in how I handle everything. Yeah, that that does, when you start running into things um, and you hear things and you can you see stuff. I, I, I've seen fathers, kind of like what you run into, a big tough guy. Uh, some guys are ex-military, some guys are uh, law enforcement, some guys are firefighters, you know, heroes that, you know, go have no problem whatsoever running into a burning building, saving someone, arresting a bad guy or a, a bad girl. Or, you know, I've seen moms also, you know, who are, you know, firefighters, law enforcement, military, tough women. 
and they get, you know, it's their child's wedding day, their daughter, son, and they're just very happy and proud and they break down. And to me, that's, that's the human side of this special day. And to me, it, it, that's why I like, love doing weddings because it's that honor and privilege of being there, but also it's the, you know, that, that you see that, that connection that they have and you make that day special as, you know, providing music and making sure everything is running right and coordinating and so forth, so on. It, it's to me, it, it's a big thing. So that's why I'm like, you know, I was wondering if someone else had another really great story kind of like I had, again, I, I, I'm trying to be kind of vague because I don't want to give too much away of their personal information um, other than that one part, but there's a bunch of other things in there they talked about. And again, they came from where they're at there to there where they're at now is a huge thing. And again, I've heard other people's stories about, you know, people being sick, people physically challenged, having accidents. And, you know, I remember those. I you know had a young lady earlier this year. She has some ailments. She's wheelchair bound. She's physically you know, uh, she's physically uh, you know, um, it, she's physically can't stand for long periods of time or walk stuff like that. And I, again, I totally understand that. I have a bad knee. I can't stand for long period of times and walk a lot of times. You know, uh, far distances. So it, it's one of the things I totally understand that. And but she's much worse than off than I am. I'm not trying to say I'm equal to her. I'm not. Uh, she's wheelchair bound and she walked down the aisle of her wedding and someone who's physically challenged. She did that to walk to her husband. And, you know, here's this guy who again was a firefighter and saw his bride walking down. He just look at his face, the, 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 the joy, the love he saw looking at her. Again, those are very powerful moments you run into. You see at a wedding and you feel very much privileged to be there. And you just feel very much like this, this is a very special, this is stuff that you don't forget. You know, these are weddings you don't forget. Yeah. Again, we do, I do tons of weddings and every wedding is different. And that's one thing I try to get to know the people a little bit. Cause again, it's their, per, their special day. I want to personalize things. I want to make sure things are done right. And I want to make sure it goes off hitches, but even all our couples this year, last year, or our past years, all the past, you know, basically 19 years of weddings we've done, all those people that we've run into, you know, again, those stories you hear here and there, you're like, wow, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty, you know, amazing. And just, I, I again, I just felt it was a very powerful wedding, this one. And again, I, I usually get a few very powerful ones a year, but this one just happened. And again, I was hoping that someone else had another powerful one as well. Um, speaking, well speaking of power, of, yeah. Oh, ahead. speaking of yeah, speaking of weddings, I actually have a wedding gig like next year, September 29th. This will be my first wedding gig in over two years. There you go. There you go. See, I told you. <laughs> so um uh, Next thing I want to talk about here is something that was brought by one of the members of the table. And it's Jeff. He sent me a message about a AI software. Uh, the title of it, it's on YouTube. Uh, the chat GT, uh, GPT of DJ is here, or according to this person. Uh, it had a link to uh, the software there with some kind of discount, I guess, for the software. And it kind of takes your Spotify playlist and puts things together in it. And it basically takes algorithm and says, okay, hey, this is what I, I could do. This is what you should be doing. You know, I know virtual DJ a lot of times will tell you, give you suggestions for songs across the bottom of your connected internet. It will say, hey, you're playing this song. You, you try this song. It doesn't always, you know, sometimes I look down like, oh, I already played that song already, or oh, right, I'm going to play that song. I'm like, sometimes, yeah, I can see that working, but AI, I, you know, again, a lot of people are talking about AI, and uh, I was wondering if that's something you would use a software like this, and would you, do you think AI is going to be a helpful thing for you? So, Jeff, again, you you brought this up to the, uh, up to, uh, the table. Uh, if you want to talk a little more about it, what your thoughts are of the, the video. And did you try the software? Have you tried it? Do you want to try it? Uh, do you want to get it? 
Uh, no. <laughs> I value my job um, d doing DJing. I mean, that's, um, you know, the, the uh, chat GPT of DJing is kind of scary. Um, that's saying that, you know, anybody can just um, push a button and, and have it have your uh, DJ, you know, go work. And it's, you know, it's not that simple. Um, you know, first you got to think about, okay, what's it going to be playing into? Is it going to be a, you know, a, a single Bluetooth speaker? Or are you going to have two tops, a sub and some lighting involved? You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's a big difference. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's aimed toward DJs. I think it's aimed toward, okay, I'm having a party in my basement and I may use this to, uh, you know, throw the music onto a, a Bluetooth speaker or maybe a small sound system or something like that. Um, so I, I think that's what it's geared toward. Um, I, I don't think it's going to put any DJs out of business anytime soon. I mean, I've got virtual DJ and the auto mix works pretty darn well. And that's, you know, five, six, seven year old technology, you know, that's, um, it is what it is. I mean, I, I don't use it uh, very often. Um, occasionally, like I had to had to run to run to the restroom one evening, and um, you know, say hey, put through three songs on there, put it on auto mix, and then just let it go. And um, and then you know, with, with uh, virtual DJ, you can choose either you know eliminate nothing from the song, eliminate the uh, fade in, fade out, or do an auto mix, you know, based on several parameters. But um, but it works fine. You know, I would never program an entire dj set you know with automix but uh there, there are people who do that though there are djs yeah there who... are yeah, and they, you know they, they will not get away with it for very long i mean when people you know part part of what i see as as being a dj is reading the crowd and bringing up the next song that is going to hit you know uh, anybody can just play music anybody can mix one song into the other but you know true um expertise comes with picking the right song next and that is an art it is not a science um you know it, that's one thing that that we can do with years of experience is say okay i think i know the next song what's going to hit hard what's going to get these people dancing or what's going to you know get people you know moving whatever whatever it takes you know, AI is coming and it's here, um, you know, in my day job at the television station. You know, one of the things we're looking at uh, coming up that's going to affect us. You know, we use an announcer uh, out of California for all of our uh, voiceover announcing. And, um, you know, coming up probably in the next year or two, there's going to be AI announcing that will take the place of a lot of the announcers. You know, you just... Uh, Type your script in, send it off to the AI. It will cut it. You tell it what you want to cut it, uh, what what uh, uh, what tone you want it to have, uh, male, female, uh, ethnic. You know, it, it, it's it's already there. You know, it, it's already there. It is just it just needs to be finalized and critiqued and and uh, and built so people can use it and pay for it. It's it's coming. You know, and and you're not going to be able to tell that from a from a regular uh, an announcer that you hire in California. So that that's on its way. So AI is going to affect a lot of things. It already is affecting a lot of things. Uh, some things negatively, uh, uh, but uh, I I don't think it's going to put many DJs out of the business anytime soon. I think it's going to, you know, for the people who use it, they're not going to be hiring a DJ to play their party. They just want uh, to play music and have it mixed you know so that's my thoughts on it yeah and you know the important part you know like you're saying the uh announcements and stuff of like that uh i know i've seen videos on youtube with the ai stuff and uh ai is talking a lot of times they don't sound say words correctly or they have the default like british accent and they're trying to sound like a proper british person it's like they say certain words like too quickly or they don't say it right, and you you could tell right off the bat that it's not a human doing it, and that's that's the hard part. You know, artificial intelligence right now—it's not true artificial intelligence. It's basically algorithms that are getting together to see and analyze what it can do. It's not actually thinking. You're telling it what to do, 
And it, because of what you're telling given parameters, it kind of goes, okay, maybe it does, maybe I do this. And is it lear a learning item? Is it like a human? No, it's not learning. It's not growing. It's not, it's basically just the algorithm is just saying, okay, uh, a high percentage of this, high percentage of that, and it, it does whatever it needs to do. Um, so cool thing. You wanted to chime in on this. Uh, I, I know that uh, there are some DJs who'd use Spotify. Spotify has their own virtual DJ in there that actually makes announcements, stuff like that. And it'll, it'll mix songs a little bit here and there. Um, I don't use Spotify, so I don't use that stuff. I do everything live, but what about you? Do you think that this is something that you're going to use in the future that you want to have an AI on your on your MacBook? If Mac, if Mac came out tomorrow, oh, say, hey, here's AI DJ heck, on a Mac. Heck no. I am all against artificial intelligence. I'm all against it. I'm an old school guy, almost 30 years old. I like the old school, picking a song manually and just let it play and to choose the songs that I want to play. I'm all against artificial. So I will not be using it ever 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 okay are you sure <laughs> it needs to die out already. just go back to the old school stuff I, I again i think hunter is pretty well set in his way that he said no uh <laughs> so I, i'm gonna go to Dwayne. do you think that ais are gonna be the next skynet and they're gonna take over the world and we're gonna have uh robots running around and uh you got to go save John Connor and for the save the future? Or do you think it's, you know, much to do about nothing and someone wants to do a backyard barbecue on a weekend, no big deal, but for big events, they're going to hire professionals. Um, it depends on what it is. I think AI is a, can be a good tool. And Jeff, what was the name of the thing you were talking about? Do you know? Uh, I don't know, buddy. Do you have that that I emailed to you? What is that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, the chat GPT of DJ is here. It's on YouTube. Um, DJ Carlo is from uh, he did it about four weeks ago, and he has a link there for the uh, software with a huge discount. So if oh. you want to get the software. What is, this? What software. is the software name? Do we know? Yeah, he's he's getting paid for this. So he's this is this is what a, is the software name, buddy? Uh DJ does, Studio. Does it have it on there? DJ Studio is a place and uh let's see here. Creative DJ mixing on your laptop. Yeah, it's basically DJ Studio is the name, and it will uh it will auto mix stuff from uh you can go from Bport, YouTube, uh Recordbox, Serato Virtual DJ, Tractor. It'll select songs and it'll export down to uh MP3, YouTube, uh MX Cloud, and Recordbox. Oh yeah, I have that. I have DJ Studio. A couple of videos I put up there, like the summertime funk or my Halloween thing. Mm -hmm. I use that. But basically, if you're a DJ, um it's easier to create your own mix as opposed to having it because the program will come and they'll put the songs together and it automatically cross fades and you can go back and make it detailed, but you spend more time detailing it to sound realistic, whereas you could have just mixed it yourself. But what I used it for, and I used it for my last two gigs was um, when I got a bunch of songs, a song, a playlist, I just put that in dj studio and tell it to um either put the put the playlist together in mixable order either by key or um beats and so that helps me uh that cut down a lot of time for me going through playing each song seeing which one i'll go so i use that for that but i thought he was talking about because craig ha hackers just came out with something called banger but buttons and you can use it in Serato. It's almost like um, Virtual DJ's um, Genius oh, DJ, where where if you get stuck and you want to, if you need an idea of what song will mix in, this thing is supposed to do it. And I haven't downloaded you know, it yet. The, the crate stuff. hackers and stuff like that, again, they're, it's marketing. Just like this software here, it's marketing. This guy's selling it. It's marketing. But the thing is that, you know, again, uh, people are trying to get on and say, oh, well, look at this, get this, make your life easier. 
I, I, I Jeff, I don't know if you, if you, again, if you feel the same way or Dwayne, if you feel the same way, but I feel these softwares are just, they're gimmicky. I yeah. feel they're very gimmicky. And again, you had yeah, the yeah. software, you've used it. You, it sounds like it's like, again, someone who is not a DJ, someone who's out there, who's not a DJ, who doesn't do this for a living has no idea how to put, uh, doesn't want to know what XLR connector is to a, uh, a quarter inch to a, you know, uh, HDMI uh, cable. Yeah, yeah. Dwayne, Dwayne had it. He hit the nail on the head. You've got to put, you got to put time and effort and pr- oh, several yeah. hours into programming this uh, software to do what you want it to do. And then when you finish that program, it will do that and it will do it seamlessly. But uh, that's what like I'm Dwayne saying. said, yeah, you know, might as well do it live if you're going to spend yeah. two hours prior to an event trying to you know figure out what goes where and doing the, the programming the uh, fades and whatnot and the and the mixing uh you might as well just do it live you know oh yeah that's what i'm saying i mean that's so, why i'm against it because i like putting the work and the effort in to my dj mixes i like setting up a practice booth and practicing for an hour or two at a time maybe three to four hours at a time and just practice putting together a mix there, right there, that picture behind uh, Bradley. That's that's all a picture. That's not real, right? <laughs> oh, it, it, that is totally not a DDJ Rev Five. No, not, not at, at all. all. Not at all. No, no, that's all fake. And that, that's that. That's not a turntable or my RZ right next to. No, it. not at all. Not at all. That's, no, no, just no, no. A fake wall. No, and and just just like all the gear you use, it's all fake gear. You just have uh, a, a little Bluetooth speaker you use behind a. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, Sarat. One hundred percent. So, what about you? What do you th- what do you think of AI basic software or anything like that? What do you what do you think about that? I'm never going to use it. I mean, it takes it there, like you know you guys were saying earlier. There, especially Jeff, you were saying that there's no science to putting on the right song next. There's it's it's an art form. You really have to understand how the ebb and the flow of a dance floor. And, you know, as he specializes as a DJ, for example, um, knowing the ebb and flow of a wedding set, you know, how you build. And I guess I was really lucky in a couple of clubs I've been at where the BPM curve and the energy, you know, that you're providing for the set was really stressed a lot. So all of my sets, I really do try to work BPMs or energy of the crowd to build that crescendo. Let's crash them, give them a little bit of a break. Okay, let's work back up there. But this time I'm not going to take, you know, 10 songs to do it. I'm going to do it in four. So we're going to make jump, 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 and we're going to be back at 128 quickly. I tend to like to sit around 125 to 130 and lock and load there for a long period of time. And it doesn't have to be necessarily like dance music, like, you know, anywhere from hotel room service, I love it or anything like that. It can be September, it can be YMCA, or, you know, that whole scope, Sweet Caroline, uh, Don't Stop Believe. It's all in that 120 to 130 scope. And for me as a DJ, I like sitting there a lot. I like, it's a comfortable spot because there's a lot of bangers that fit in that area. Um, but AI taking it over, AI wouldn't be able to really, you know, do that. They're not going to re- realize that you can hold this crowd out here for 90 minutes at 100 to 130 beats a minute, 120 to 130 beats a minute before you've really got to bring them back down, give them a breather. Uh, and, and that same token, their AI isn't going to quick mix. There's not going to be, you know, quick, cute little word plays. There's not going to be, you know, Fun transitions where you hop from one deck to the other, or you know, now with stems, even though record boxes stems are definitely not up to snuff compared to other software I've been heard, they it works well enough where I can at least get an instrumental and use an acapella intro of the song, or I can have a little, you know, I can make my mashups, I can do what I want. AI is not gonna be able to do that. You're not gonna be able to, you know, throw like a Vichy levels into Journey Don't Stop Believing on the fly. Things like that aren't going to happen. And the same scope of it would go to a club DJ. I mean, again, you you know, 
as a club DJ, you have to know what's going to make your dance floor work. And like DJing in the EDM club here in town, you have it. You have to know. Okay, I can play. You know, a couple of these songs that are like uh, Robin Schultz, Sugar, Lizzo, About Damn Time. As I'm working up to the EDM, you know, bounce remixes, so to speak, or you know, or playing you know the heavier EDM as you get further into BPM scale, like going into Animals from Garrix, or if I'm you know feeling a little saucy, getting up to 150, 160, and playing some Grizz playing some sudden death and that stuff in the clubs I'm in, you have to know when you can drop that. And if you drop it at the wrong time, you have just one, you you're probably going to have everybody in the club looking at you funny, but two, now you've got to really think, how do I get back down to that comfort zone? I was at where people were hopping and bopping. So there's that art form of, you know, try not necessarily trial and error, but let's feel, feel the crowd out a little bit. AI isn't going to do it. Uh, the joke I tell a lot of my DJs when I'm training them and working with them is being a DJ when you first kick off the night or throughout the course of your gig is kind of like dating. That first, you know, two or three dates, you're kind of walking on eggshells, not really testing the water or playing it safe, not really showing off your true personality like, you know, you would two years down the road. But then... Say you get 90 minutes into your dance set. Everybody's feeling a little bit more comfortable with each other. You've built a rapport. They trust you a little bit from the music you've played. Now you can get a little bit more edgy with it or where the couple wants you to go or where the club wants you to go. And so now after, you know, that's like we've been dating for a year. I know you, you know me, but I'm certainly not going to fart in front of you until we live together or something like that. So now you get to that last hour of the night. If you've played your cards correctly, just like in dating, you know, you've scored a home run or the crowd loves you. Now you can get away with playing, you know, your your favorite kind of dance music that you know will work with what they want. So AI can't do that. AI is not going to read, you know, I can probably, you know, I can't go heavy on the dubstep yet. But I can, you know, throw in a lighter the, you know, a lighter track and work my way there if I want to. And or seeing that, yeah, I might love playing the heavier dance stuff, like, you know, like in the house spectrum, so to speak. But you can try to fit, and sometimes it's like fitting a square peg in a round hole. It's just not gonna work. And you have to rethink it all. AI isn't gonna do that. They're not gonna see what's directly happening in, in front of you. And no one's going to be able to take or replace that art form. Well, and like you like you touched, you know, no, they're not going to see what's happening. What's happening on a dance floor? What's transpiring on a dance floor? Is the dance floor, you know, are people dancing or is the dance floor empty? It's put going through these motions, going through these songs, but it doesn't see. And the other thing is that, you know, biases. And the reason I say biases is because you may love country or you may love edm or you may love rock and you put those in there oh yeah i got foo fighters oh yeah i got slip now oh yeah well at your event you get people like me who okay so like tracy loves those uh bands i don't do i know their songs yeah that's not a problem do i there's they have some good music they have some great artists do, do i go to a slipknot concert no tracy does <laughs> I would rather go to, you know, EDM concert or something like that, or, you know, more of a pop concert, you know, um, because I like different music than she does. Now, if I went to an event and she was programming that software, it's going to be her biases. She loves that kind of music. So you can hear Foo Fighters, Godsmack, you know, and, and groups like that, which is great. She, she'll love the music. She will have fewer friends out there and her and her couple of friends will be dancing having fun but everybody else will be like hey you know what What time is it oh it's time to leave because it's not broad enough it's too focused for a small group now if you had a you know a bar or something like that that you were known for rock or whatever and people were coming in for that that's that's another thing you know and dj brantley i, I know you had uh put a post a picture on social media of yourself uh, on a stage 
a few years ago playing um uh playing an instrument and it's one of the things that again you've been in bands you've done music and you have appreciation for all different types of music but do you feel that you know people came to see your band do you feel if you started playing something else, you start your band to say, Hey, tomorrow we're going to start doing EDM or we're going to start doing um boy band or we're going to start doing something else. You think you keep those same fans. You may get new fans. You may keep a few of the other fans, but a lot of your fans will be mad. Wouldn't they? By far. I mean, the bands I played and we were, I was in a punk band and I was in a bluegrass band of my two notable bands that were together for longer periods of time. You can't go from playing either one of those and we're going to be a boy band now or, you know, anything. It's you're so genre specific that your fans are going to expect that. Like, it, it just doesn't work. And not many bands really make that jump. I mean, I mean, Metallica, for example, you know, the metal detector hasn't gone off for them since like 1995 or something. But they're still making rock music. Is it Metallica, in my opinion? Meh, whatever. But... Every genre, I mean, they're still similar to how they started. They're going to grow and change and develop as a band, but I haven't, I can't think of any bands that have flipped either, like completely gone from doing this. Well, maybe Ministry because they used to be synth pop, but uh, that's about all I could really think of bands that really tried to flip genres or something. Speaking of synth pop, um, I went to go see Duran Duran in Atlanta, Georgia back in like September or August or so. And they're mostly synth pop, and if they change their genre, it would be a. I wouldn't really go with them because I knew they were a synth pop band. But they're not going to come on tomorrow. It's not going to be Duran Duran, the new metal band. They're not going to be coming out dressed in masks <laughs> like uh, Slipknot, and start uh, having one of the guys in Duran Duran start having you know two turntables and start scratching, and the other ones are screaming a microphone. And slashing, you know, a guitar and a bass, and they're going to get the, you know, uh, well, I, well. However, they do have a, a drummer. The Slipknot drummer is not Slipknot drummer anymore. They got a different drummer, so uh, they could get uh, could get him to come uh, do him as a new drummer for the new rock band that uh, Duran Duran would turn into. Uh, but again, I don't think they're going to be doing that anytime soon. And that's the thing is that that's that the software, you know, AI software. I feel also what everyone here brought up is that the programming who's programming it, you know, us as DJs, we try to uh, cast a wide net versus you're, you're a person who likes certain music. You're going to be very narrow. And that right there to me is a huge, huge thing. Um, but I think that, you know, again, we'll, we'll have to keep, keep our eye on it and see what happens. And Jeff, thank you for bringing up this, uh, this, this whole entire topic. Cause we're going to talk about more and more because it's it's going to be a, a force of topic. People are going to ask questions. Customers are going to ask questions because customers are going to see these buzzwords and go, yeah. oh, well, what about AI? Can, do you use AI for cocktail hour? And, yeah, someone who's using Spotify, they can say, oh, yeah, I have – this is my Spotify playlist for cocktail. And, you know, like um, Matt, he used Spotify for cocktail. Uh, well, speaking of Matt, I said his name. He appears like Beetlejuice. You can say his name three times, and he comes in. So let's do it. <laughs> Matt, Matt, Matt. Yeah, Matt, 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 Matt. There he comes. Look at this. It's like Beetlejuice. He takes off this. There, there he is. <laughs> bitter um, rival. Stop. Yeah, look at that. I'm talking about everything. Oh, we're, we're talking about AI there. a little bit. Your and talking about... Do I look better? Oh. This, is the, this is from the M3 Max. Oh, 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 oh. oh, I ha I have I was explaining before before uh I have a, a container for your uh, Mac here for you so oh, oh. <laughs> it's thirty four hundred dollars of pure beautiful gorgeousness it's such you a got, sexy machine. you got M three yeah M three Max top of the line I'm still on Intel <laughs> well it's again so Hunter you, you got to save your pennies nickels and dimes up and you'll be able that, to get that's my time. first purchase for next year I really want a new laptop. Well, I'm mostly going with the uh, M2 MacBook Pro with 8 gigabytes of RAM, probably 512 of storage. You can use an external hard drive and have all the storage you want externally. Um, to, use, to use stems, run video, run lighting, and mix on record box. Like, I'm pushing the outer edges of my my Intel 9, and I've got a dual, uh, dual 16 RAM, 
And yeah, I'm, well, I've got dual 32 on this one that I got. But when I buy my next laptop, I definitely have to kick it up just a little bit more. Yeah, this is what I use for DJing. We were talking about AI. There's no AI on this bad boy. It's no, all you're man. AI. No. Well, go, going back to, you know, if someone says, hey, you use AI. You know, technically, Matt can say he uses AI a little bit for cocktail because he has used a Spotify playlist. So he could say he uses it. And again, someone like myself, I'm going to say, no, I, you want Spotify's not going to watch what's happening, see what your guests are doing, and you want the same playlist everyone else has. So there's, there's pros and cons to everything, and there's ways to sell around things. Doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. It's just how you want to approach the subject. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I got to thank Jeff for bringing this up to the panel and bringing it up to the table for our discussion. Um, and then, uh, Matt, I didn't get a chance to talk about this earlier. I don't know if you were listening or if you weren't. Uh, yeah, that was what, the client calls. Okay. But... Uh, I had a wedding, interesting wedding this past weekend that the vows between the couple were very, very powerful and emotional. Um, like, I won't forget the vows. Uh, and I won't forget, the part, one of the part of the vows I talked about in here was the, uh, they were financially very, down uh they were eating um they would eat you know one meal a day and this 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 day they had uh, a cheeseburger from somewhere each one guy had their own cheeseburger uh meal and there was a homeless guy going through garbage cans looking for something to eat and the groom walked out and gave him his his meal his 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 food said here you go to this homeless guy and they had no extra money to go buy more food for him so he went a day without eating to take care of another person. And I was asking the panel if they have a ceremony, a couple that touched them emotionally with a very big impactful um, backstory. And uh, really, no other than me, no one really has one. I was wondering if you had a, a, a good backstory on someone, you know, they have uh, something that they, you know, they, 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 the two of them had a bad time and they, Persevered, persevered, and came over, overcame the um, uh, that hmm. day, or that week, or that know. month, or that year. I don't know. I mean, most of the vows. I mean, honestly, I just tune it all out. No, okay. but um, most of the vows are like humorous. Uh, at most of my weddings, like they insert a little quip about you know something their partner does that uh either bothers them or is like their you know that's their thing like my girlfriend loves carbs so you know my vow would be to continually feed her carbs every day until she explodes <laughs> um you know something like that but i don't know i've never i've had a few that like they were well that's the thing like i don't really get invested in my couples so like we had one where they mentioned like some serious accident and like neither me nor my assistant obviously knew what the accident was um, and how much it impacted them and what it changed. But I mean, I don't really get, I'm not an emotional guy. Um, the only time I've cried recently was for Marcel Lachelle, the movie, uh, <laughs> which I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. But um, I don't know. I don't really get, I mean, most of them are just kind of gushy. Like, you know, I promise to love you and all your quirks and, uh, you know, something about the dogs. But, I, I've had some that were like really sweet though, like not to where they moved me in any way, but where they were like, wow, like this, this is true love. Like you could tell there's some vows where it's just like pretty surface level. And then there's some where like, wow, these people are actually meant for each other. Um, so those are, those are the ones that kind of stick with me uh, are those, but uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I've never had that, uh, had him go that crazy or that uh that emotional. Okay. And, you know, again, that's why I was asking the panel if anyone had that. And if you out there have had run into that, you know, put it down in the chat. Put it down there. You know, talk about it down below. Uh, your, you know, if you have any critiques, criticisms, comments, town fool or anything else you want to say down below, make sure you say it down below down there into the comment area. And make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. Make sure you click that thumbs up icon and make sure you click the bell and also all the social media for these guys on your YouTube channels will be there as well. Except for cool thing. Cool thing has retired officially 
from YouTube as of right now? <laughs> maybe. Oh, maybe. No, forever. Maybe back. no, forever. Maybe, I'll bring you back. maybe, maybe one day he may change his mind. Uh, that's up to him. I'm not going to force him. I'd like to see him back on YouTube. He makes some great content. Um, but again, that is entirely up to him. The other thing we're going to, last thing I'm going to talk about really quickly here is next week being Thanksgiving. Um, no, not next week. Uh, yeah, it is next week. Yeah, next no, week. I'm sorry. Yeah, next week being Thanksgiving. Next week. Next Thursday. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the calendar. And I saw uh, Brentley look up like, what? Yeah, next it's week early. being Thanksgiving. Um, we kick off high engagement season. And this is a very quick uh, one for the table. Are you ready for high engagement season? I know Tracy and I are. We have uh, gone through stuff. We made sure we still have enough of our brochures uh, to do some wedding shows. And also make sure that we get in touch with couples uh, quickly. Our goal is always to get in touch with a couple within an hour of contact, either via one of the wedding websites or via our own website. We try to contact people very quickly uh, and get back to them. But I uh, guarantee cool 10 thing. minutes. 10 minutes is my guarantee. I try to get back with an hour. That's, that's And it's a personal goal. message. It's not even a copy paste or an automation. Oh, yeah. We always personal, personal email. So cool uh, cool thing. Are you ready for high engagement season coming up? I'm ready, but I'm not that lucky when it comes to being booked because I haven't been booked for a wedding in two years. And I don't know, they choose other DJs in the area. So I'm probably not that lucky when it comes to being booked, but I am ready. Okay. You are ready. Jeff, are you ready for high engagement season? Sure. Bring it on. <laughs> DJ Brantley, are you ready for high engagement season? I think so. Um, I know I'm going to raise my prices again. Uh, I've been stewing on it for about a month now. And I think I'm going to raise my basic package 100 bucks, and my premium package by 200 and see how it takes. And if it doesn't, I, you know, I'm, I can always drop back. But I think I'm going to go up until December 1st. And you know, make you know, do some kind of advertising of it. Maybe going through you know, December thirty first, and then start January one. But definitely raise my prices because I'm more or less booking twenty five now. I'm. I think I've counted my total open Saturdays for all of next year, and I've got two or three, is what I came up with. And one is, and uh, the fourth one being my daughter's birthday. Nope, can't book that. So I've got three I can book at that point. Yeah. And if I don't book them, I'll just go pop, you know, back to back club night somewhere, which will be close to the money I would have made anyway. So, yeah. Okay. I think I'm ready. You're ready? Okay. I think so. Okay. Dwayne, are you ready for high engagement season? Uh, Yep. I'm always ready. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that a base boss jacket you got on? Whoa. This one? Yeah, yeah Base Boss has that same pattern on their jackets. Oh, yeah. I got it from one of sports um companies. Oh, okay. I forget the name of it. Yep. Gotcha. I'm ready, buddy. My my Google ads are finally back up and live. Google finally. My man, Akruti, I give him all the props in the world. He made it happen. He contacted whatever team he needed to and finally got my account verified after being down for a month and a half of not being able to run Google ads. Uh, which is crazy because I, I pay I pay a company a monthly fee uh, to manage all of my campaigns and it's it's like five hundred a month or five fifty but a hundred percent worth it I mean the minute that the ads stopped like like the minute they took over like I booked one that day like I would get so many they've been able to target the couples that I want to target and I don't know why I'm advertising for them but <laughs> I'll give you their info if you want to. Get into Google Ads. No, please, I was, please, please uh, get, I was, share the info because this is something that every market's different, mm -hmm. um, and every I DJ's tried, different. Yeah. yeah, I tried Google Ads and it's not safe for me. I keep getting bullied, harassed. I did try putting my business on Google, but that didn't work. That's how I got. Yeah, there's it. a there's a certain way to do it because if you do it the wrong way, like I was doing before, you get a lot of spam. Or for me, I was getting a lot of Spanish speaking clients, which I have a bilingual DJ I can refer them to, but 
if I can't even communicate with them, like I'm not going to be able to make any money on that sale. So I just be like, Hey, if they book, give me like 200 bucks. Um, I don't know if they, I'm do stick or, with the, whatever, but. yeah, I'm just going to stick with good old social media. That's how I get my bookings through social media, DMS, people refer me on other like Facebook groups and stuff. Yeah. It's all about getting well, the content. Here, here's, here's one other thing also that's going on, uh, which I just ran into yesterday. And I'll share with the group as well. Um, I use uh, Network Solutions for email, uh, which is a big company. And they have very secured servers. And sending out emails through them to customers, uh, I started getting oh. bounce backs. Oh, internet connection unstable. There we go. There we go. I uh, gotta love internet lag. <laughs> um, starting to get bounce backs yesterday from Google accounts, and Google has a new updated security to reduce spam. That you know, if you're a non-Google email, so like professional emails, which a lot of people have, and you send an email to Google, um, a Google account, which a lot of customers have, um, it started bouncing back. I sent an email to Tracy's Google account, my personal Google account, um, our backup business Google account, so forth, so on, going through these different Google accounts as keep them bouncing back, bouncing back. I got a hold of uh, technical support um, and they fixed it and I'm back up and running, but the technician was saying that it's just started uh, recently and that... Uh, a lot of the email systems out there are now going to play, starting to play catch up because not starting to hit. And originally Google said it wasn't supposed to start until February of next year. So with your professional email system, depending who it is, um, I would definitely would see uh, if you start seeing bounce back from Google accounts, you want to contact your, your provider for your business email talk to them because they had to do a bunch of reprogramming on <laughs> on their end to basically make sure that Google could see it, that it's a secured and a authorized uh, email. Uh, it's one of the ways that, again, they're trying to come back spam. Um, we, we don't want spam. We want the, the spammers to go away. <laughs> I don't want to uh, get emails from a dying rich prince that wants to give me millions of dollars. Uh, so yeah, I can send him a check. Uh, so I could pay for the taxes or whatever, um, or uh, a couple that wants to get married in my town on my date. And if I live near that town and wants to pay me to pay for the uh, wedding coordinator and photographer, and they'll send me one check, I got to pay them, and then yeah, uh, the keep the rest. You get to keep five hundred dollars just for your extra labor. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> that's always a great scam. What? My emails, uh, I use Outlook. Uh, well, it's at live.com because my website is DJ Solstice live.com. So DJ Solstice at live.com. And almost 95% of the, it, if it's to Gmail, almost 100% of the time it goes to spam when I first reach out to them. So I get an inquiry, I send them an email and I send them a text as well. Um, and then I get almost 100% response rate on either a text or email. My, my goal is to have them go to the email because the text is just a short little blurb of like, hey, uh, this is DJ Solstice reaching out. I received your inquiry, replied via email. Please let me know uh, if you didn't receive it. Check your spam filter, whatever. And then I say, you know, I open the door. Please feel free to reply here or I look forward to hearing from you there or here. Uh, so basically whatever's easier for them, whatever they're more comfortable with. If you want to do it via text, great. If you want to do it email, that's fine too. So uh, that's how I combat it. I don't have that problem with any like any professional like business place that reaches out to me like those my because most businesses use Outlook and Microsoft's services. I don't have that problem. Same thing with Yahoo. I never have an issue with Yahoo, but like that's why I don't really do mailing lists from the wedding shows. I don't rely on a lead list. I just collect the leads myself and I text these people. Well, and, again, uh, again people you text from a lead a lead list. It's it's blind it's blind. It, they could already have a DJ and you're there's get your email. They're like they're marketing as spam. When you get enough spam marked in Google, they start looking at your emails. Oh, this must be a spam account. Versus yeah. you target the right customers, you don't run into that. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Um, other than that, we are 
we're kind of done with tonight. Anyone else want to add anything really quickly before we jump off here and say this is a done turkey? And no, not at all. <laughs> no, okay. we'll get back to it when we're done. So there you go. So a uh, couple programming notes. Next week we will be here. The week after we'll be here as well. So because uh, Thanksgiving is a Thursday and good uh, Black Friday. Uh, Wednesday, I know a few people here, I know at least one person here is going to be dealing with, uh, bars on Black Wednesday, um, making some big money and, uh, having his stickers all over lacrosse and watching new YouTube videos from, uh, uh, <laughs> on YouTube for those, uh, lovely, lovely, lovely residents of lacrosse, uh, doing, Is that a uh, thing? Black Wednesday? I, you know, I've no, heard no, no. It. it's Black Out Wednesday. I've heard it's the biggest drinking night of the year. I've never once went out to drink the day before Thanksgiving. I, I don't know. I, I know drink. a lot of people do. I will say, being in a small, smaller town, you know, Black Blackout Wednesday last year was bonkers. I mean, everybody's coming back home mm -hmm. for the holidays, and it's the first time they've been back home since probably Christmas or maybe Easter. But uh, yeah. Black Wednesday and at least in lacrosse is nuts. I don't, and even when I was back home in Chicago, it was pretty crazy because you got all the people coming back to their old neighborhood for you know the night before Thanksgiving and they're leaving them you know Friday morning to go back to their normal lives. Well, I, I look forward to your Wednesday coming up being on. Oh, I can't Blue wait Cam, on Co Blue Cam <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> I don't want to see you on there. Uh, I don't want to see no one on there. Uh, but it's always interesting how lacrosse, uh, even donut operator, uh, has talked about lacrosse. Uh, he'd love to go there sometime. Um, <laughs> you have some interesting oh, yeah, characters they, there. They were on that show, weren't they? Oh, lacrosse is all over Code Co Blue Camp. All yeah, over. Yeah, all over. That's right. Yep. And the other thing also is that, uh, oh. uh, yeah, it was a, <laughs> oh, I got some stuff. Okay. Yeah, I got something to say. The but, only Tuesday I will not be on this show is Tuesday, December twelfth. I'm gonna be in South Dakota because my brother's graduating from college, so I'm gonna be coming on live. No problem. Or maybe you get you get your phone out, you hop on real quick, say hi to everyone, you hop off. We won't miss you. It's okay. Because <laughs> who's gonna say goodbye? Yeah, that's true. So oh, Hunter, no. I'm, I'm leaving it up to DJ Solstice. <laughs> oh, peace he's passing the torch one time only. So with that said, Matt, I know you're not going to say it, but Hunter, we no, just out. Peace out, everyone. Peace. <laughs>